if I'd have known all of y'all was going to show up like this, I'd have just scheduled myself to preach. But uh, amen. No, we're going to have a marvelous time. Uh, God loves tents. That's how he started. And uh, I think that God's going to do a lot more uh, in the next few years to come with tent meetings. And uh, there's just a freedom about it, isn't there? And so I want to say thank you for coming. If nobody's told you they love you today. I love you. He always tries to steal my lines. But if nobody's told you they love you today, that really means it. (laughs) Amen. Amen. But uh, I want to say thank you. I know that many of you have made uh, a great effort. I got to meet Pauline. She's 92 came all the way from California just to be in this one meeting. So I know a lot of you have drove a long ways um, and God's going to reward it. We're going to have tremendous... Listen, we got two really great preachers for this tent revival. And uh, I'm believing (laughs) that they're going to lead my wife to the Lord. You walked right into that one. I so I did. Are you going to give me a minute just to say hello? Go for it. Okay. Well, I am so excited that you're here. I've met so many of you, and I do love you. This is an exciting time, and I'm telling you what, Jesus Christ is Lord over this tent, over this meeting. So there's something that the Lord has shown me about this area, this area called River Gate has been a very depressed, oppressed area. And I believe in these meetings, we are going to shatter the spirits of darkness that has covered Rivergate. And the floodgates are going to be open to Rivergate. The glory of the Lord will be released this week. And I'm so excited about it. Jesus is Lord. Come on, somebody say, Jesus is Lord. Come on. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Amen. Well, you're, you're standing in the parking lot of our brand new church that's behind you. And uh, we're going to have a marvelous time tonight. We're going to have a marvelous time when we walk into that new building and dedicate it to the Lord. So why don't we go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you. Lord, I I know that you orchestrated tonight. And God, I thank you that angels are holding back demonic hordes that would try to come and, Lord Jesus, destroy what you have decreed as our portion. So, Lord, we loose the anointing in this whole region. And, God, every stronghold that the enemy has owned for decades, even for generations, we break that in the name of the Lord by the anointing of God. Now, Lord, as we go into worship, it's unto you and you alone. We give you the praise and the glory for what you've already done, but, Lord, also for what you're getting ready to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah.
I call your name. Something happens when 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 I call your name.
across this tent tonight. Holy Ghost, we call on you. Oh, Holy Ghost, come and work in the deep things tonight, oh God. Lord, we make a place for you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we seek after you tonight. Our hearts are open to all that you have for us, oh God. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who have gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Say your name is the highest. Your name is the highest. The greatest, the greatest is the greatest. greatest. Your stands above, stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. And the angel cried, Holy, all created. Yeah. 
Valley Church. Come on, church. Come on and magnify him. He's greatly, greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. For said, God, why have I had to stand at the Red Sea with my enemies behind me? It looks like I'm going to die. The Lord says, because I had you as bait to bring your enemy into its place of destruction. The Lord says, I'm bringing you through unto the other side. And the pressure, says the Lord, that has been upon you did not kill you, but it has made you stronger. But the same pressure that's been on you, says the Lord, I'm getting ready to release now into the enemy's camp. And what made you stronger is going to destroy them by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I say unto thee, saith the Lord, that you have stepped over into a realm of the sudden leaks. And it's not going to be months, it's not going to be years, it's just been in times past. But God said you go to bed and wake up and everything will have already changed in your nation. 
And the Lord says, have I not already showed you I can take that which man said no and I can make it happen in a fortnight. If I could give you the speaker of the house, says the Lord, that would stand and quote the word of the God. No, this saith the Lord. I have had men and women in every camp and now I'm getting ready to bring them forth out of those camps. I'm going to cause men and women to come out of Hollywood that have been sleepers. And all of a sudden, says the Lord, the Spirit of God is going to rise up in them. And they're going to declare, I don't care what it costs me. I am going to declare the Word of God. For this is an hour, saith the Lord, that my glory is going to be released in the earth. And I am not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. And I say unto thee, saith God, at his tough as this year has been you are stepping over into the supernatural you are stepping over into the miraculous I am removing the labor out of your world and I am releasing the harvest upon you saith God and the anointing of the Lord is being released now in another dimension and another dimension by the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to do signs that will make you wonder at the miraculous. It's getting ready to happen in the house of the Lord. Your houses will be strewed with crutches. Hallelujah. What you've watched on video of times past where the power of God has brought them out of sick beds and healed them. You're going to see with your own eyes for I have raised you up for such a time as this and the strongholds that have ruled in this nation saith the Lord I am going to break them by the power of the Holy Ghost I'm not going to do it out of politics I'm not going to do it out of the arm of flesh but I'm going to come out of the north saith God with the wind of the Holy Ghost and when the wind of the Spirit of God begins to blow what the enemy called dry bones the Holy Ghost called a living, breathing army of the Spirit of God. I'm going to release resources. I'm going to release abundance, saith God. For this is not a cheap move. This is not a backwoods move. This is not a storefront move. But God said this time, I'm going to put you on a national scene. I'm going to let the nations around the world behold the glory of God. For this is my hour, saith the Lord, and because you have passed the test and you stood it, God said, get ready. I'm bringing you into rest. Rest. Rest, saith the Lord, because my hand is upon you, saith God.
because God is going to send out his good all over the nations, all over the world yeah. from this land, yes. from this very ground. And what a privilege to be able to be the first to give an offering. Isn't that a privilege? I was thinking how our intercessors, they have seeded the heavens this week. Now, this is your opportunity to seed the ground. That's it. That's it. That's I hope it. you got an envelope. Let me tell you. All right. Listen, you can sit down just a minute. While the ushers are moving, if you can sit down, we have envelopes, and they're going to pass these out. If you don't have one, you can raise your hand. Listen, why don't we just pay this thing off tonight? Well, I, 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 it ought to be better than that. I said, why don't? Why not? Why not tonight? I'm believing God to do something special. You have, a, you have an offering envelope. You can uh, make a check to Regeneration Nashville. Uh, you can go online to regenerationnashville.org, and you can give that way. I just had one simple word that I want to share with you. Get, and get ready to give. My, what an awesome, as, as, as Sandra had said, what an awesome opportunity to do something first. You know, you don't get a lot of first in your life. At my age, you don't get a very many first. All right? So you, you got a chance to do something first here. And so, but I was thinking today, what about an offering? An offering, listen, an offering is like leaven. It's like leaven. An offering is like leaven. You that bake and I don't. Know that if you're going to bake bread, you got to put some leaven in it. And that leaven infects the whole loaf. So your offering tonight is leaven. You are infecting your entire finances. How many is ready to leaven your finances? What that means is what you're giving... What you're giving tonight is going to cause what you have to be more. Are you hearing me? It's going to cause what you have to be more than what you carried in here. So tonight, my goodness, all across the room, I'm just going to bless this. We're going to declare it. Get your leaven in your hand. Come on. Get your leaven in your hand. Come on. Get your leaven in your hand. Come on. Get your leaven in your hand. Won't you lift it up? Lift that leaven up. You're getting ready to leaven your entire finances tonight, and it will be a change. And so, Lord, we just thank you right now. We thank you that your presence has stamped this place tonight. And, Lord, your glory... Your glory is going to resonate out of this place. And even this evening, lives are going to be transformed, saved, delivered, healed, miracles. And we cry signs and wonders for your glory and your honor. And so tonight, Lord, as we give this, we thank you that as leaven, it moves in, not away from us, but into our future and into our finances. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's bless the Lord as Pastor Candy comes. Praise the Lord. We love Pastors Harry and Sandra. First of all, I just want to say that if you're driving a black Volvo and you're from Kentucky, your lights are on. And so you will definitely want to run, turn those off so you'll be able to get home tonight. So uh, black Volvo with Kentucky lights. So uh, I'm just, I'm so excited to have you here. This is, this is such a dream come true for us. 
And uh, I wanted to tell you, our new building is right behind us. And uh, we used, my mom used to bring me to this building and we would shop here when I was a little girl. And what a surreal uh, experience it has been to walk through that building and know that this building is being transformed by the glory of God. And I'm just, uh, just, and for the glory of God. So I'm just so excited about that. I have a few acknowledgments that I want to make, and then I want to ask where you're from. But uh, first of all, I just want to say that we have some very distinguished guests in our audience, and I want to acknowledge Brother Timothy Dixon. Where's, stand up, Brother Timothy Dixon. We honor you. We honor you. Thank you so much. Uh, because he has provided this tent. He's been here for about a week now uh, with his team setting up this tent. And so we are grateful to you and we honor you. Thank you so much. God bless you. We love Brother Timothy. Also, Brother Tony Suarez is in the house. Stand up, Brother Tony. We, we love you. We honor you. We're excited to have you here. Don't be great. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Nancy Alcorn, Mercy Multiplied. Stand Nancy, let us honor you. We love you so much. Also, the Isaacs, the Isaacs family are in the house. Would you stand and let us welcome you? We honor you. So there's a little method behind the madness here. They were supposed to sing tonight. And Sonia, the blonde-haired one that plays the little mandolin, is in the bed with laryngitis tonight. And so they were not able to sing. But you have honored us with your presence, and we thank you for being here. We love you so much. They're a part of our Regeneration Nashville family. So I also want to acknowledge those that helped set up the tent all those who volunteered to set up the tent, would you stand and let us thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just some faithful men of God that came and uh, set up all these poles and all of that. It's just amazing. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to that. Also, we've had prayer partners. We have had a prayer team on the premises that have been praying down the glory of God before you ever got here or last night and today uh, and uh, days in advance. So I want our prayer partners that have been here praying, I want you to stand and let us thank you. We love you. We honor you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We love you so much. Appreciate our prayer partners. Uh, come here, Cooper Brady. Y'all, this is my little grandson, Cooper Brady. Yeah. And he made his debut singing. This is Jasmine that sang, led worship. This is her oldest. And he made his debut singing uh, this week at your choir concert. Before long, you'll be singing on this platform with your mama. So what you got? So he's in charge of the T-shirts, and uh, he has got a, a Kent Christmas hat for somebody. Are we giving this away or are we selling it? We're giving it away. We're giving it. Who are we giving it to? The first one that comes down here to get it? Let's do that. First one that comes down here for it. Anybody that wants his hat? All right. There you go. There you go. Uh-oh. All right. Okay. Oh, my goodness. You got a sack full. We got a cookbook. Hey, I got to tell you this. You're going to love this. We, we appreciate all the, the cookbooks and stuff, but I want to tell you this. You're going to love this. So he went to uh, Pastor Karen Wheaton's ramp, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. So he's been pretty excited about Pastor Karen being here tonight. And so he's been practicing. He's been practicing getting to meet her and talk to her. What, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I, I'm nice, nice to meet you, Pastor Karen. <laughs> Might need a little more practice there. Don't, I love this boy. I love this boy. Okay, so let me see your T-shirts real quick. He, he's got him a T-shirt. Y'all go back and make Cooper's Day. Are you over there? You're at that table right over there? Okay, he's got y'all a T-shirt made for camp meeting, and it's, and it's right here, and he's been working hard on that, and it says uh, camp meeting on the back, 
And so, yeah, yeah, Pastor Karen wants that. So when you go sit down, you take that to Pastor Karen, okay? All right. And so, so all we got a whole bunch of T-shirts. This is your mama, his mama. He's selling his mama's T-shirt. And so let me tell you how it works. All the T-shirts are on sale for $10 except the camp meeting one. Camp meeting one's not on sale. But all of the T-shirts are $10. And so um, y'all go make Cooper's Day. His mama's got a new CD. Oh, his grandma's got a Christmas CD. So Christmas is coming up. And, uh, and so his mother has some wonderful music. And did y'all enjoy the praise team? My goodness. My, my goodness, powerful. So anyway, y'all buy them like hotcakes. Because if you don't, we're going to have to eat them like hotcakes, okay? So anyway, y'all give Cooper a good hand for his hard work. Now, now this is my favorite part right here. I just want to find out where everybody is from. Indiana, stand up. Everybody from Indiana, stand up. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I met some Louisiana folks. Where's Louisiana? Stand up, Louisiana. He came all the way here, yeah, to help with that tent. Brother, what day did you get here to help with that tent? What day did you get here to help with that tent? He came in Tuesday to help set up the tent all the way from Louisiana. We love you and we honor you. We do. And so our dear friend from uh, Southern California is here. I want to ask, is anybody else from California here? Would you stand and let us welcome you? All right, right there. Stand and let us welcome. And this, this lady right here, we love you. Thank you so much for being with us. I met some folks from Virginia. I think Richmond, Virginia. Where's Virginia? Stand up, Virginia. Let us welcome you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? That's your cousin. Y'all just, we're going to have family reunion right here. Look at it. Yeah. And so, uh, okay, so after that, I'm lost. Where, who, where are you from? Ohio. Come on, stand up, Ohio. Glad to have you here. Ohio, yeah, yeah. Well, we, all right, welcome. Well, I know there's Kentucky because your battery's dead. Where's Kentucky? <laughs> stand up, Kentucky. Stand up, Kentucky. Come on, Kentucky. Yeah, we honor you. We're glad you're here. All right, anybody else from out of state? Pennsylvania. Stand, Pennsylvania. Amen. Hey, I met some Wisconsin folk. Stand up, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. Honored to have you. Bless you. Anybody else from out of state? Michigan. Where's Michigan? Stand up, Michigan. We welcome you. We welcome you. Uh, did y'all come together? You got folks behind you. You got folk behind you from Michigan. Did y'all come? Y'all don't know each other. What? Family reunion, see? Yeah, I heard somebody else over here. Where? D.C.? Washington, D.C.? We didn't know there was real Christians over there in Washington, D.C. Hey! Hey, there, there aren't any. She came to Nashville. <laughs> no, no, joking. God bless you. We're honored to have you. So, uh, uh, Elizabeth Sisler, who you got? Michigan. Is that Michigan? St All right, stand up, Michigan. We're honored to have you, too. God bless you. All right, anybody else? Texas, where's Texas? All right, Texas. Honored to have you. Was there anybody else from Texas on this side? All right. Well, who else we got? Alabama. Stand up, Alabama. We're glad you're here. Yeah. 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 We love our Alabama neighbors. We sure do. Anybody else? I'm fixing to close, but anybody else from out of state? Tennessee. All right. No. Nope. I tell you what, I think we need to give Tennessee a hand, don't you? Yeah! Yeah! We love you. We sure do. We're glad you're here. So I have the wonderful privilege, and, and tomorrow, if there's somebody I overlooked, we'll get you tomorrow night. 
But uh, I have the wonderful privilege of bringing on our musical guests. Uh, they came for revival tonight to and also to hear the Isaacs. And uh, we have prevailed upon them to go ahead and bless us in music. And we love these mighty men of God. We do. These are powerful men of God. And they're like family to us. And I want you to give a good, warm welcome to Higher Ground. we go. David said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits unto me? He answers his own question. He said, I'll offer him my praise. Somebody ought to give him some praise. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Mark. This is a great time to praise the Lord. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Praise has a sound, but worship has an aroma. And I have smelled the presence of God in here tonight. Come on, thank God that your praise is incense unto the Lord. Thank you, God. Y'all know we won't be outdone. If we have to, we'll just sing without anything. Praise you, Jesus. You're there, aren't you, brother? Praise is a vehicle that takes us to God. But worship is what we do when we get there. Yeah, there we yeah. Are. Ain't it all right if I praise Him? Just 
That's good singing. Amen. I can't imagine what it's going to sound like when we get to praise God for the first time without our own nature being present. Without there being any demons in the atmosphere. Without the wonder gone, have I done enough to get to the other side? But just the knowledge that I'm home, that I won. Hallelujah. My God, there's going to be a sound begin to come up out of us that I think no wonder the angels will stand in silence and wonder and say, we never heard anything like this because it's the song of the redeemed. Hallelujah. The song of the redeemed. And if there is no more time, I wonder how long the first song service is going to last. I wonder who will be the worship leader. Who's going to play the instruments? But it's going to be a, a moment of great perfection. I don't know, it might be 600 years before we ever stop. Because a day with the Lord is just a thousand years. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Amen. I, I'm so glad that as I look at you tonight, that we realize the church is alive and well. <laughs> Hallelujah. Alive and well. <laughs> and that God has marvelous things in store. And tonight we're, <clears throat> we're in store for a wonderful blessing. Uh, as I was thinking about uh, Karen Wheaton and her ministry, in the 60s, the enemy began to lay the foundations to come after this generation, begin to remove the prayer and, and the word of God, begin to <clears throat> raise up a generation that became lukewarm, that did not see the need to bring their children into the house of God. Until now, we have a generation of young people that many have never been to church, never been to Sunday school, never were raised around uh, <clears throat> a new birth experience. And God put Karen on the front lines to go after that generation. Those young men and women who will be powerful in the kingdom of the Lord and uh, I believe that God is dropping the age limit on who he's going to use in these last days. So <clears throat> I, I told um, Brother Tony Suarez, I said, um, you know, a lot of times when a, a preacher is a woman, they'll say, well, she's one of the best female preachers I've ever heard. And I said to Tony, I said, you're going to say she's one of the best preachers. I've ever heard. Hallelujah. And uh, it's my privilege tonight to give this uh, pulpit to this woman of God. I want you to come ahead. And um, we honor the gift of the Lord that's in Karen Wheaton. She is. Uh, she's earned the right to stand on this platform. She has war stories to tell that created the anointing that's getting ready to come out of her. I love you. Preach the word of the Lord. Would you give Jesus one more time just the best praise that you possibly can? Come on, make it glorious. Oh, Nashville, make it glorious. Here it is, Jesus. Your praise tonight, every clap is yours. Let it pierce the heaven over this city. Come on, Nashville needs a breakthrough tonight. I believe it can come from this tent. I believe it can come from this tent. Lord, let there be an open heaven over this tent tonight. I wonder what would happen if you just did it one more time and gave him a praise that was over the top. Jesus, hallelujah. Every 
I believe when it's from your heart, it pierces all the way to the throne room of God. Don't you believe that? I guess you can be seated, but right where you're sitting, let's just lift our hands. Lord, over this place tonight, even over this tent and over this city, let there be an open heaven with angels ascending and descending. We give you glory. We declare the Lordship of Jesus over Goodlettsville. We declare the Lordship of Jesus over Nashville. We declare the Lordship of Jesus even over our nation tonight in the name of Jesus. We just, let's shout it out, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Give him one more hand clap of praise. Truly, the Spirit of the Lord is in this tent. I just walked in and sweet memories were flooding my heart walking in the tent. How many of you remember tent revivals like I do? You've been in some? How many? Almost half. The only thing we're missing is some sawdust. Maybe an old B3 organ back here, right? I'm kind of glad we don't have the sawdust. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm thankful for that. We can, but... It's good to be back under the tent. It just feels like some good times. I think God likes tents, right? He does. Remember the word. I mean, he hung out in tents. So, Lord, hang out in this one this weekend in the name of Jesus. I'm excited about what God is doing in this building behind me. Oh, my. I wish I could have come a little earlier and had a tour of the place. This is incredible. What a location. I want to look at every bit of it. I think it's not big enough, and you ain't, got it, you ain't even got any yet. But that's okay. The Lord will take care of that, right? Oh, this city needs you. This city needs this ministry. It needs your voice, and it's going to hear it loud and clear. I'm stirred in my spirit. I'm touched to see so many of you here tonight on this Friday night. I'm especially touched to see so many friends. Of course, Pastor Kent and Candy mean more to me than they know. I honor you greatly and the work that you're doing, your family, all of them, all of them. Jasmine, you blow me away. That voice of yours, so anointed of the Holy Ghost. I was thinking tonight when y'all were singing, that ought to make people stop on the road just to say, where is that coming from? Pastor Harry and Sandra, their family too, Rick and I, they are on the board of directors for the ramp. And uh, just means so very much to us. They're like, truly like family. Nancy Alcorn, I love you, sweetheart, in your ministry. I honor you. Tony, I tried to talk Tony into preaching tonight, but he wouldn't do it. I wanted to hear Tony, but I, I'm so thankful for you and what you're doing for the kingdom of God, sir. You keep it up. You've only just begun. Barely scratched the surface to what you're going to see. I believe that. The Isaacs. I couldn't believe you were here tonight. My heart melted. I love you, Becky. Lily, thank you. Levi, you need to get back to the ramp, son. You belong there. <laughs> you belong there. Will you pray with me for this word? It's really heavy on my heart. Father, I am here tonight to deliver the word that you gave me. I pray that, Lord, you will anoint me to speak it exactly the way you want it spoken. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to rest upon me and help me, Father. I pray that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to your church in 2023. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it and run with this word in the name of Jesus. And we say, amen. Well, I love preaching here. I've, I've been able to be with Pastor Kent and Candy on several occasions, but this time just feels a little bit different. I've had this camp meeting on my spirit for days. By the way, Front Porch Friends, I just see you. I just know that's who you are. I just see Front Porch Friends all over this room, and I love them, and they know it. 
But I've had this, this camp meeting on my heart for days, and it's just been, it's like something I knew God was wanting to do for you this weekend. I knew that he was wanting to speak to you this weekend. And uh, I believe this weekend is very significant, not only for you personally, also for this church, but even the results of what God wants to do this weekend can affect a nation. It's that serious. And I really do believe that. So I've sought the Lord over this word. I have listened all week. I have listened actually for more than this week for days. What, what are you wanting to say? And, and I'll tell you the truth. The Lord has laid one thing on my heart, and he began the word in March of this year. When I was here in March, I preached a word for the first time. Lord, thank you for your alarms in Jesus' name. And we hear the alarm from heaven, but we also pray that ever who they're going to get or take will be brought into the will of God for healing and deliverance. I like to pray over every ambulance or something like that I hear. But when I was here in March of, 20, of 23 of this year, I preached a word that, for the first time actually, that the Lord had laid on my heart. And I have not been able to shake that word. I've thought about it for months. And as I have pondered that word, the Lord has taken me into some different components of it and revelation of it, that almost tonight I feel like I have come with part B. All right? So if you were not here at the women's conference, and I got a feeling a lot of you men were not, I will have to give you a little recap somewhere in the middle of this message, and that I will do. But this is going to be exactly that, because here's what I heard the Lord just say to me. I have not changed the subject. I'm still, I'm still speaking about the same thing, and that's what I want you to deliver. And it's the only thing I could hear. It is impossible tonight for me to preach a normal church message. I have some. But how can I preach a normal church message when these are not normal times? It is impossible for me to stand in this pulpit tonight and ignore the current condition of our nation and Israel at war. Those things are just kind of hard to put out of mind. And I don't think we should. I heard someone recently say something that just caught my attention. I've kind of pondered it a bit. And they said that uh, it seemed to them that what is happening in Israel, in the natural realm, is happening to the church in the spiritual realm. That being said, that would mean we are at war. And while it's true that humanity has actually been at, in a spiritual war since the Garden of Eden, this is different. It just feels different. And you know it. Do you sense that too? It appears that we are in, a, in an accelerated time. I believe it's an accelerated time of Revelations 12, 12, where the Word of God says that Satan will come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. Could it be? We're beginning to walk into some of those days. I fully believe so. And if Satan is going to fight as though he knows his time is short, shouldn't we fight as though we know our time is short? Shouldn't we be awakened to that reality tonight? So this may not be a real feel-good message, but I'm not sure God's in a real good feel-good mood with the church. I think he may be wanting to prick us and stir us and shake us and wake us up until we hear what God is really saying to the church. We are so prone sometimes to live from this natural realm, this tangible world, that we forget that in reality, this war that we are in right now is not a political war. It is not a cultural war. It is a spiritual war that's manifested in the natural realm. You know that. 
It is a war between light and darkness, between deception and truth, between the church and Satan himself. I was thinking about this this afternoon, actually, pondering even just that statement. The reason I'd, I'd kind of always thought, you know, but it's a war between God and the devil, but not really. It's really a war between the church and Satan because God is not at war with the devil, so to speak. I mean, when Satan rose up in heaven to rebel against God and his idea of war, God just kicked him out of heaven. He was expelled immediately from the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. And now this war that has been raging since man gave the deceiver the keys to his authority in the garden. But thank God that our father loved us enough to send his son to fight a battle for us that we could never win. So the truth is, this is our battle with the enemy. It was a battle that we could not win. So Jesus came himself to fight the battle for us. Jesus did not come to the earth to fight the battle for himself against the devil. He came to the earth to fight for us against the devil. And it was a war that was won. It was a war that was actually waged for six hours. It was a six-hour war, come to think of it, with him hanging between heaven and earth at war with our enemy until he cried out, it is finished. And when he cried, it is finished. According to Colossians 2.15, it was then that he spoiled powers and principalities and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So much so that Satan himself said, had I known what I was doing, I never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Give Jesus praise tonight. Oh, Thank you, God, for your victory, Jesus. And so now, as long as we stay in Christ, we will fight this battle from a place of victory every time. If we're going to live in the flesh and we're going to be motivated or paralyzed by fear, we will be consumed by the enemy that we're fighting, and that's just the way it is. That is why tonight you cannot afford, we cannot afford to stay hunkered down in front of our television sets right now, gripped in fear, like the children of Israel who were all hiding behind the battle lines in Israel. While Goliath was shouting his profanity, his mockery, and his intimidating threats. Surely tonight, there is a David in the church of 2023 that will cry out, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? Surely tonight there is a David among us that would stand up to a compromised church who's mocking David for his boldness and say to them, is there not a cause? I tell you tonight there is a cause. There's a cause worth, worth fighting for, and there's a cause worth dying for. Our children are a cause. Our grandchildren are being slaughtered by an enemy who has robbed them of their identity, of their gender, and of their purpose. You better believe there's a cause tonight. You better believe there's a cause tonight for a desperate, lost generation. Melovono, our nation is in crisis. Israel is at war. There is a cause. And tonight I came to Nashville, Tennessee as the prophet Samuel looking for David. When it was time for the changing of the guard, God called Samuel. He said, go find David. I'm changing some things. Surely among us tonight, maybe even under this tent, 
There is somebody, a David among us, with a heart after God, with worship on his lips, and a slingshot in his hand that can look at Goliath face to face and say, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come at you in the name of the God of Israel. Oh, and today God is going to conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds of the air and the beast of the field and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. Hey! I declare tonight the whole world is about to know there's a God in Israel. Hey! I said the world is about to know there's a God in Israel. If you believe it, give God praise. I've been thinking a lot about the circumstances of our world. I'm 63, never known days like this. Something happened in 2020, you know that, I know that. It just began to accelerate. You'd think, will it end? No, it hasn't. It's gotten more and more. So you have to ask yourself some questions, and I've been asking God some questions. I've been looking, as many of you I'm sure, at the condition of our nation currently, spiritually, the church, the condition of the church, there's pockets like this that there's great revival, so it's not all bad. But there's still some things that blow me away. You're looking at a nation that has sown sin, and according to the word of God, the wages, in other words, there's a cost to sowing sin. The wages of sin is death. There's 60 million dead babies. That's just one thing. How, mu how much more do you want to keep? We've spent years spitting in the face of God, at his plan, the way he wanted to do things, mocking him, living Psalms 2, let us free ourselves from slavery to God. And I, I've just been pondering this because I have great concern whenever I look at the pattern of this word of nations in rebellion. Because right now, I'm just going to talk about our nation because I'm in America. We're living in a nation that has become a prodigal nation. And according to this word, when you see nations in rebellion to God, there's a cost payday that comes. Judgment. It's the law of God. And I've been asking the Lord, is it inevitable? Is, is it inevitable for this nation? Is judgment inevitable? Is there, is there anything that can be done? I've just been, I've been having these questions in my mind with God, just talking to him like, Lord, is it, is it just going to happen? And is there, or is there anything that could be, I don't know, God, just tell me, is there something that we could do? Is there anything you want us to do? Or is it just going to happen? And, and we, there's nothing we can really do about it. And God began to speak to me. And he began to answer me. I was sitting on my back porch in September of this year, just a little over a month ago, thinking about this early with the Lord. And as I was talking with him, I heard him direct me very specifically certain passage of scripture, and as I began to read the scripture, I knew that he was giving me what I believe are three words that describe where we are right now in this moment of time for the church that actually affects the nation and the world. But it's a word for us. 
If you could say to me, Karen, describe, give me, give me, give me one word, which is going to be three, that you believe just sort of summarizes this, just this fleeting moment that we're in right now, it would be these words. Who knows? Perhaps. Strange words, I know. But I heard them as I read the scriptures he led me to as I was asking him my questions. He led me to Joel 2, and I believe it's where we are tonight. Sound the alarm in Jerusalem. Raise the alarm on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. Verse 12. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief. Tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate. He's slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Who knows? Perhaps. He will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this curse. Did you get it? I'm reading it right out of the Bible. Return to me. Come to me. Bring me your heart. Now, when Israel hears these words from the prophet, it's because Israel was in rebellion to God. Judgment was barreling toward Israel. When in that moment of time, the Spirit of God calls to a nation and says, come to me. The Lord is merciful and compassionate. He's slow to get angry. Bring me your heart. Who knows? Perhaps. God will give you a blessing instead of this curse. When I read that, I knew it was as though the Spirit of the Lord is calling us as he was Israel. In the same urgency that he was for Israel. It's, it's unbelievable how much weight is weighing on those little words. Who knows? Perhaps. It's as though everything for a nation was being weighed in the balance on those two, on those three words. Who knows? Perhaps. In other words, it's, 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 there's an option here. In other words, I'm giving you another way. I, I'm, I'm giving you a little window of opportunity right here. It's a small window as judgment is heading towards you. Hang on just a second. He's saying, hang on, come to me. Who knows? Perhaps as though the whole nation, listen to me, the future of a nation was determined by the response of God's people to that call. Could it be tonight? The future of a nation, the future of America is being weighed in the balance and will be determined by the response of God's people to that call. Return to me if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. If my people... Could it be the future of a nation is being weighed in the balance tonight, is waiting on the response of the people under this tent tonight to this call? Because I believe that right now, while the world is looking around to see what's going to happen, I believe Heaven is looking down 
to see what's going to happen. We have more to do with this than we realize. You matter more than you know. Your prayers are more effective than you know. So if heaven is looking to see what happens, it reminds me of 2 Chronicles 16, 9 that says the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the whole earth just looking for somebody he can show himself mighty through. I believe it's looking for somebody that will hear the call of heaven to come and to return to him and seek his face. He's looking for intercessors. I drove to Nashville. To give you this word from God. His searching eyes are looking again for intercessors. There is no other answer. There is no other way. Now, this is what I told you in, in March. This is the part that I'm going to have to give you a recap on because some of you were not there. But the Lord has revealed something else to me about this story. That is very important to our response to this call. And this is this. Okay. His eyes are looking for intercessors. I told you in March that in 1949, his eyes found two intercessors. Do you remember that? Do you remember how many of you were there in March when I was sharing this? Good. Then y'all can help me tell the story or you can tell the rest of them when y'all get home. His searching eyes found two ladies in the Hebrides Islands. It was November of 1949. If you remember, I told you about two ladies, Peggy and Christine Smith. They were sisters, remember? Peggy was blind. Christine was, had crippling arthritis. They were 82 and 84 years old. Keep that in mind because that's important. They're 82 and 84. That tells me if you're breathing, you're needed. That tells me there's no such thing as retirement in the kingdom of God. You can rest when you get to heaven. You can retire when you get to heaven. If you need to rest a while, rest over there. If you're breathing, you're needed. Christine and Peggy. I love this is what history says about them. It says they were little known by man, but well known by God. Don't you want to be like that? This is what was interesting to me. I'm going to recap it for you. I had to go back today and look at my notes to recap, but listen. This is what it said of them. They became greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their parish or their church. Because there was not a single young person that attended their worship services or their church. History says they were troubled by a growing trend of young people toward worldliness. Now listen to this. It became clear that an outpouring of God's Spirit in revival was the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation. A verse gripped them. You remember what the verse was? Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. They began to pray this word. Those two women begin to pray that promise. Now, that's huge. That is huge. Because when they begin to pray, Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. When they begin to pray, that verse is when things begin to shift. Why is that? Because when you pray the word of God, you pray the will of God. And when you pray the will of God, you can have whatever you ask for. Come on. They started praying that nonstop. God, you promised that you would pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Now, the word of God, when you start praying the word, honey, that word is so full of life, you activate it by faith. And when you activate the word of God, it will go out. He even said in Isaiah 55, my word that comes out of my mouth does not return to me void, but it will accomplish that for which it was sent. Oh, come on. When you speak the word of God in prayer, it's going to go out and it's not coming back void. It's going to accomplish that for which it was sent. So this word is just full of fire and life. And it will just sit there on your desk sitting there as, as, as just another book in your house. 
until you take this word and you take it off and you begin to get it into your heart and you begin to pray it out of your heart by faith and you activate this word, you'll activate its promise. Peggy and Christine began to pray that word, and when they prayed it, they decided to do this. They decided, as you know, to pray twice a week. They set a time, Tuesday night, Friday night, from 10 p.m. to 3 or 4 a.m. every morning. I'm going to say that again. It's important. Twice a week. Tuesday nights and Friday nights. From 10 p.m. to 3 or 4 a.m. Twice a week. There are 82 and 84. There are 82 and 84, just to remind you. I'm glad they didn't say, well, you know what? I mean, at my age, I'm just, you know, some, I can let those other people at the church pray, and I'm already saved and just going to go to heaven someday. No, they were not content to just sit in the house and do nothing when they saw their young people and the generation that they had that they were responsible for. When they saw the crisis they were in, they were not just going to sit back and do nothing and talk about how bad things are. And isn't it awful in our world? And isn't it awful in our nation? Can you believe how bad things are? No young people go to church. They said, we're not going to sit here and just talk about it. We're going to go talk to the one who can do something about it. We're going to start praying twice a week. One night as they were praying, Peggy, the blind one, had a vision. And she saw the church of her fathers packed and crowded with young people, packed, in fact, to the doors, and a strange minister standing in the pulpit. Peggy was so stirred by the vision she sent for her pastor. She told him her story and what they were doing and about the vision. The pastor took her message as a word from God to his heart. Turning to Peggy, he said, What do you think we should do? What? Peggy said to him, Give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to waiting upon God. Get your elders and deacons together and spend at least two nights a week with us waiting upon God in prayer. She asked them to join her and her sister at the same time on Tuesday nights and Friday nights from 10 to 3 or 4 in the morning. Peggy told her pastor, you pray in the barn. We'll pray in the cottage. In other words, Peggy said this. We'll pray here, you pray there. When those words, this, I was studying this. I mean, just in these past few days, all of a sudden I realized it was the answer to our, who knows, perhaps. This is a strategy from heaven that Peggy had. It came out of the Spirit of God, what God showed her. You will pray here, you pray there. When I read it, I knew it's the strategy for the church of 2023 in the crisis that we are in. I came from the ramp in Hamilton, Alabama. We are calling our people to greater prayer. And I came to Nashville, Tennessee to look at you at this church, a regeneration church, and to ask you, can I call you to prayer for the sake of a nation, for the sake of a generation? Can I ask you tonight, as Peggy asked her pastor, you pray here, we'll pray there. Come on. You pray here, Nashville. We'll pray there in Hamilton. Those of you from Ohio, Nashville is saying to you, we'll pray here. You pray in Ohio. Louisiana, you will pray in Nashville. You pray in Louisiana. Come on, Texas, we'll pray in Nashville. You pray in Texas. And do you believe God can bring an awakening to our nation? Seven men were praying in the barn at the same time Peggy and Christine were praying in the cottage. As I told you in March, this continued for weeks. That turned to months. Nothing was happening. The men, too, were praying Isaiah 44.3. The men, the pastor and his deacons were praying Isaiah 44.3. Still nothing. They said it was dry. Nothing happening. Nothing moving. Until one night, one of the elders actually said these words. 
I wrote them down as I read them. He said, it seems to me to be so much humbug to be waiting as we are waiting and praying as we are praying when we ourselves are not rightly related to God. He began to quote the scripture, who will ascend the hill of the Lord, who can stand in his holy place. This is while they're praying. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, no idols and no deceit. And as this young elder was praying those words, he stopped in the middle of his prayer. They said he looked up and he said, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And when he said those words, they said the man was slain in the spirit. And when he was slain in the spirit, this is the way they, they said it exactly. Something happened in the barn at that moment. There was a power loose that shook the heavenlies. Because the bowls of intercession had finally tipped over. And the Spirit of God swept through the parish and gripped the community with such an awareness of God that people were awakened at 2 and 3 in the morning, filled with such conviction of sin, that they got up, they dressed themselves, and they headed for the church. History says this. History says the next day, the looms were silent. Little work was done on the farms as men and women gave themselves to thinking rightly about eternal realities. Prayer meetings erupted in homes throughout the island. Oh, God, I'd love to say this about Nashville someday. Come on. Could this be a history? Come on, could we just believe that someday somebody will stand up and be saying this about Nashville? Oh, that prayer meetings erupted in homes throughout the city. History says, you can study it for yourself, that in one of those prayer meetings in a city just outside of where Peggy and Christine live, around 1.30 in the morning, the people from that city began to pray. And they were praying Isaiah 44, 3, as Peggy and Christine had been praying. And one of them stood up and said, God, because their city was so dry, God, your honor is at stake to fulfill this promise. And when they prayed that prayer, they said the house began to shake, physically shake, until dishes in their kitchen fell off the shelves and broke. Don't say it can't happen. Go read your Bible in the book of Luke. I mean, Acts, where the place where they prayed was shaken. Come on, I would love to see some prayer meetings where they're so fervent in prayer and so filled with the fire and passion of God that the place where they prayed, I'd love to see it tonight that this tent could be shaken. Come on, does anybody even believe this can even happen? Do you even believe it anymore? Is there any hope in you still left that we can see this kind of a move of God? may be seated 75% of the converts, of the thousands of converts that were saved in that four-year revival were converted before they could even get to the church. What happened was Peggy and Christine, two women, 82 and 84, were not content to be satisfied and comfortable or make excuses for their age or their physical condition. They decided they're going to do something. And so what could they do? They couldn't go preach. They weren't evangelists. They weren't prophets. All they could do was pray, but their prayers awakened prophets and awakened evangelists, and it caused the Spirit of God to sweep through their city to such a degree that the revival, here's what it was known for. The revival was known for, watch this, an awareness of God gripped the community. An awareness of God woke people up out of their beds so gripped in conviction, all they wanted to do was to get to the church. I believe the hour is so late in America 
that we don't have time for church or even revivals as usual. Revivals are good for awakening the church and reviving the church, but a true awakening will impact a nation and cause a nation to be awakened. I'm telling you, we don't have time just for another church revival to stir up the same people that's already been revived. We've got to have an awakening for a nation, and we don't have time to play church anymore. We've got to have an awakening that's stirs people, shakes people, will bring people to repentance out of Washington, D.C. and every city of this nation that would bring Nashville to its knees. I've been concerned about praying for an awakening lately because part of me says I'm not sure that we would like it, what cause, what it will take to bring it. Because pretty church has not worked. Pretty church has not brought people to prayer. Something's got to shake the church out of its comfort zone and excuses and cause them to be concerned enough to pray and seek God. And I believe when the church seeks God, and it doesn't even take many, it just takes a few. That's why it doesn't matter how many's in this tent tonight. It doesn't even matter if everybody likes me and agrees with the word. If I can just get two people to say, I'll start praying, we can see this city shaken and awakened by the power of God. I don't know of another message to preach. I don't. I don't know of another message to preach. Because I don't know of another hope for our nation. Our answers are not coming out of Washington. Our answers are not coming because we have a different kind of election. Our answers are not coming out of anything that man could ever think up or drum up. We've got to have a true awakening from God. And the only way we're going to have it is if his people begin to pray. And that's just the way it is. Come on, why, why would I bring you this story again? Why would, I bring, why would God tell me as I prayed over this conference, this camp meeting, I'm not changing the subject. I'm not changing the subject. Why would, why would Christine and, and, and Peggy even matter to us in 2023? Truly, because our children, our grandchildren, our cities, and our nation is in trouble. And you know that. And I believe, like, like Peggy and Christine said, it became abundantly clear that an outpouring of God's spirit and revival was the only hope to supernaturally reverse the situation. I told you in March, and I still mean it. Esther, your time has come. I've been reading about Esther all over again since March. Well, really since September, fresh. And it blew me away what I saw. Not only to what God led me to in Joel, or what God led me to, to study Peggy and Christine and that revival and what they did. But he took me back to Esther, a young girl in a situation she didn't understand and yet had grown quite comfortable in her palace. How do I know that? Because when that wicked spirit of Satan himself plotted his plan to destroy her people, the Jewish people, the same spirit that filled Haman is the same spirit, demons don't die, is the same spirit that filled Hitler and Hamas. Same spirit. But Esther responded, I pray to God we do. At first, when Esther was confronted, she wasn't too sure about what was going on. I think sometimes when the church even hears the call of heaven, they're not really sure. What, what do you, I mean, nobody really likes to be awakened out of a good sleep. Not too sure about that. And when Esther saw Mordecai outside of her window in sackcloth and ashes, weeping and wailing, she was like, you know, she didn't really, really, really want to be too bothered with this. It's heavy. It's not, I don't know if I really want to be too involved with that. So she even sent down some nice new little Persian clothes. Something you can change clothes, Mordecai. That's a little heavy. 
put something happy on. So when I look out the window, I don't feel troubled. I don't want to feel heavy if I looked out the window. So Mordecai sends her clothes back with a message of what was happening to her people. And she still wasn't totally sure about getting too involved with this. Because she sends a message back to Mordecai. And she says, Mordecai, you know, as everyone else knows, that to approach the king without being invited means sure death for me unless the scepter comes down. And his response to her, I believe, is God's response to us tonight. Mordecai sends this message back to Esther. Esther, don't you think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. Esther, he said, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your family will perish. But who knows? Perhaps. Who knows, Esther? Perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Oh, come on. Esther had the same call we've got. Who knows? Perhaps, Esther, your people are being weighed in the balance. This thing could go either way, Esther. And I love what, I love the way God answers the question for us. When I ask God, is this inevitable? Is it going to happen no matter what? I love what Mordecai says to Esther. Esther, more deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place. In other words, there are certain things that are inevitable. Yes, ma'am, listen to me good. There are certain things right now that's happening in our world, that's happening in our nation, that are just inevitable, and nothing anybody can ever do is going to stop it. It's the law of God, and it can be the plan of God. But here's the difference for you tonight, is what Mordecai says to Esther. Deliverance for the Jews will come up from some other place if you keep quiet. But here's the problem, Esther. You and your family will perish. Certain things are inevitable. God's people will be victorious. I don't know when, but someday there's going to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. I don't know when, but someday, someday, a mighty move of God is going to sweep this nation. And God's Spirit's going to be poured out in the last days. But if we keep quiet in 2023, at a time when our nation is in the condition it's in, deliverance will eventually rise from some other place. But you and your children and your grandchildren, your family, will be swept into the deception of this culture and they will perish. That tonight is why God brought me to Nashville and said, I'm not changing the subject. I am looking for intercessors. And I came tonight to tell you, come on, Mordecai is looking for Esther. Samuel's looking for David. God is looking for somebody to stand in the gap, just like he found when he found a friend in Abraham. <laughs> I'm telling you, God's not playing games tonight. He was looking. He's, he's always been looking for intercessors. He found one in Abraham. I'm almost finished. I'm wrapping in a second. I'm nearly done. He found a friend. In, he found an intercessor in Abraham that could have saved a city. You know the story. It's in Genesis 18. He raises them up in moments of crisis. In moments of crisis, God starts looking. In moments of crisis, God starts looking. 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 Genesis 18, the cry of Sodom is loud. I'm telling you one thing, the cry of America is loud. He says, I'm not, judgment is coming to Sodom, but I'm not going to destroy it until I talk to my friend Abraham first. Comes himself to talk. Abraham, looks like I've heard a great cry from Sodom and Gomorrah. I've come to see if it is really as bad as it really is, I'm going to destroy this city. Abraham turns around and he says, oh, oh. His, his, his conversation is mind-boggling. 
W would not the God of all the earth do what is right? Surely you wouldn't destroy the righteous with the, wi with the wicked, would you? I mean, I mean, what if there's 50 righteous in the city? Would you spare the city if you find five, 50 righteous people? He says, I'll spare the city for 50. Well, for, for, what if you found 40? If you find 40 righteous people, it's on, surely you, you would spare a city for 40 righteous people, wouldn't you? I'll spare it for 40 righteous. Yes, I would. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to keep asking, but let me ask one more. What about 30? I'll just, I'll save it for 30. Well, Lord, I know that I'm, I'm asking a lot right here, but 20? I'll, I'll spare it for, for 20. Uh, God, forgive me. I know that I'm sackcloth and ashes, but let me just ask you one thing. What about 10? If you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, would you spare the city for 10? Spare it for 10. Here is the interesting. Abraham stops with 10. And so God stopped where Abraham stopped. Where have you stopped? Where have you stopped? I just have to wonder what would have happened. I don't know. It's just my own thoughts. If Abraham had have gotten down because there wasn't ten righteous people in the city, so the city was destroyed. But what would have happened if Abraham had just taken it on down just one more time and said, but God, what if, what if there's just one? Who knows? Perhaps God would have sent a blessing. Instead of a curse. Because that's the power of an intercessor. Come on. Do you hear me tonight? I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Perhaps. But I know cities and I know nations tonight are being weighed in the balance. And I know God's searching eyes are looking across Nashville, Tennessee, to see if there's anybody that will hear his call. One more. He found a friend in Moses. In Exodus 34. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. It shows you the power of intercession. It's mind-boggling what happened. I ain't got time to read it, but it's, you should go read it for yourself. Moses, Abraham, friends of God. <laughs> I just, that whole interaction with both of them is just, it's unreal when you walk with intimacy with God where you can go. And so Israel has sinned again. Like they do a lot in the Bible. Like America has done a lot. Israel has sinned. God was so angry with them. He says, Moses, come here. Those people that you brought up from Egypt. I love that. The people you brought up have corrupted themselves and they're worshiping a calf and they're saying that that calf brought them out of Egypt. I'm going to destroy them all. I'm going to kill them all. And I'm going to make out of you, Moses, the great nation. I love, love what happens next. Listen to this statement. It's in the Bible. Go read it for yourself. And then God says, Moses, now leave me alone so that I can destroy them. Unbelievable. That even God knew, if he starts talking to me, I know what's going to happen. If he starts talking, I know. Uh, that's why God was so angry. He says to Moses, leave me alone. And what does Moses do? He didn't say, well, that's a pretty good idea. I like the idea of being a, you raising a nation up out of me. No. Oh, God. He's one that grabs the hand of God. Grabs the hand of his nation. Oh, oh God. The people you brought up out of Egypt. <laughs> I love it that he just threw it right back on him. Those people that you brought up out of Egypt, God. If you destroy them, what will your enemies say about them? And this is my favorite line that Abraham prays. And then he says, and God, but God, remember the covenant you made with your friend Abraham. Remember, God, remember your friend Abraham. 
and you can go look it up in the Bible for yourself. It's right here. I'm going to read it right there. You can look at it. And after Moses prays that prayer, it says, God, remember your friend Abraham. Go look at it for yourself in those letters right there. And so God changed his mind. Don't you tell me intercessors can't change the mind of God. It's all in this book. It's the power of the intercessor. It's the power of intercession. It's the power of prayer. Grab, come on, get up on your feet all over this room. I want the band to come. Oh, so God changed his mind. Listen to me. Listen to me. I want to tell you a little secret that I believe Abraham, well, I know it. I know it for a fact because in Psalms, listen to me. Whoa. In Psalms, I can't remember the exact number right now. I know it's in Psalms. The Bible says, talking about the friendship that Moses had with God. The Bible says that the children of Israel knew his acts. Moses knew his ways. In other words, the children of Israel only knew what God did. Moses knew why he did it. See, that's the kind of friendship God is inviting you into because Moses and Abraham discovered a secret about God. They found out something about God that not many people know unless they get to know him very intimately and very close. Abraham and Moses could talk to God like that because they had found out as they began to search out the deep places of the heart of God. They found out as they dug deeper and deeper that there's a place deep inside of his heart where mercy will always triumph over judgment. Oh, mercy will always triumph over judgment if there's an intercessor. Mercy. That's why Joel said, Joel said, I found out this about him. He's actually merciful and compassionate. He's slow to be angry. He said, I found that out about him. And I found out that if you'll return to him, who knows? Who knows? Perhaps. In March, I did something. I think I'm going to do it again. Young man right there in the brown jacket. Come up here, sweetheart. Yes, I want to do this right now in a different way. Sweetheart, come up on the stage. Sir, in the plaid shirt, join me. Remember this, ladies? In March, well, I feel led to do it right now for a different reason. Come here, son. God tonight is calling for intercessors. Now, let me tell you something. This comes all the way down into your house. Because if you stay quiet and comfortable in your palaces at a time like this, outside this tent, you stay comfortable in your churches, blind to what the world is, what's happening in this world. You don't want to be bothered too bad if you stay quiet at a time like this. Deliverance from God's people for them will come from some other place. But your children will perish and your grandchildren will perish. But who knows? Perhaps Nashville. Who knows? Perhaps to every person standing in this building. Who knows? Perhaps you were born for 2023. Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps, perhaps you were born. For who knows? Perhaps you're still alive for this moment for your children's sake. Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps your heart's still beating for the sake of your grandchildren. Because if you don't pray, who's going to pray? I'm telling you tonight, when you pray, it matters. And when you don't pray, it matters. I want him to represent somebody to you. Your child, your son, your prodigal daughter. Yes. 
I don't know who he represents for you, but let him represent somebody. And I want to remind you of what I did, reminded you of in March, because God told me to do it. You need to look at him really good. You need to take a good look at the condition of your family tonight. And you need to ask yourself some questions. You need to look at every one of them individually by name and say, are they ready to meet God? Is my granddaughter's heart right with God? What about my grandson? If Jesus does come tonight, are they ready to stand before God? I know you may be, but are they? Is your daughter ready? Is your son, is your family ready? Are they all in? Are they in, Rahab? Do you have them all in the house? Because things are about to come down. Is everybody in the house, Rahab? Because you're the only ones that's going to make it. Everything else is coming down, Rahab. I'm asking you tonight, do you have everybody in the house that needs to be in the house? You need to look at your house. And intercessors, you need to look at your nation. You're here for a reason. You need to look at Nashville or the city you're from. And you need to look at it like Christine and Peggy did and say, this is not okay. Because I want to tell you something. As much as we are living in Joel 2, we are also living in Ezekiel 22, 30. When Israel had sinned, I searched for a man who would make up the hedge and stand in the gap. But I found none in Ezekiel. And so the land was destroyed. Once again to prove when you pray, it matters. And when you don't, it matters. When you pray, we'll see awakening. When you don't, will see destruction. When you pray, you'll bring in God. That's what we did. Remember this? Remember this? Sweetheart, pretend like I'm holding your hand. Hold my arm right there. This is who you are, intercessor. This is what God told me tonight to tell you in Nashville. This is what he's looking for right now in 2023 with Israel at war with America being weighed in the balance for what's about to happen to our nation. Come on, right now, with an open border and terrorist cells among us and not knowing what may happen today or what may happen on the news tomorrow. I'm telling you, when we pray, it matters. And if we do not pray, it will matter. Do you hear me tonight? It's an urgent call from heaven. Do you hear me tonight? is calling for intercessors to take the hand of a son or a daughter, their family. Come on, take them first. Pray for your family right now first. You got to take the hand of your prodigal. You got to take the hand of your husband, of those that you love. Get their hand. Grab my arm right there, sir. Come on, and you hold on to God. And you're the one. This is who you are. This is who God's looking for. See, God can't reach them right there because there's sin. But what he looks for is somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and say, God, if you're looking for intercessors, I'll be one. I'll stand in the gap, God. You can use me, God. He's looking for somebody that believes. His word is greater than their bondage. I want you right now, if you've got a prodigal loved one, stretch your hand toward this boy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna pray over them right now. Come on, sweetheart. If you've got a if you've got a prodigal son, daughter, loved one, husband, wife, family member of any kind, listen, intercessors, I want you to pray like you think Jesus could come back tonight. Pray. Pray like you believe your prayers matter. Pray like you believe your prayers are the only prayer that's going to be prayed for them. Come on. Pray like you believe it. Pray like you believe it could be their last chance. Pray like that. Pray. Pray. Come on, Nashville. That's right. Don't stop. Come on, honey. Don't stop. Lift your voice. Call their name. Go get them, God, tonight. Awaken them out of death. Raise them up out of slumber. Shake them out of complacency. Let them be gripped with an awareness of God. 
Come on, Dad, pray for your son. Come on, pray for your granddaughter. I pray that shackles break. I pray scales fall from their eyes. Oh, God, go get them tonight, 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 tonight. Let addiction break tonight. Come on, don't stop. Let addiction break tonight. Pornography broken, homosexuality destroyed. Oh, God, open their eyes to who they are and who you made them be. Loved by God, called by God. Break every wrong relationship, every wrong soul tie. Destroy the deception. Now I want you to do this. I want you to put your hand on your heart. I want you to pray this. Say, Father, grip my heart with this word. Lord, grip my heart. Stir my heart and break my heart for what breaks yours. Father, give me your heart to pray with, to intercede with, in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to do one last thing. I want you to bring me that American flag. I saw a message from Cindy Jacobs yesterday. She had a prophetic word for this nation, and it was alarming. I respect Cindy greatly. She was giving out an urgent, what she called 911 call to prayer for America because of what she had seen and the word of the Lord over this nation. Son, I want you to hold this flag as though it were you. I want it just to represent. I want it to represent this nation. I just want it to represent... I want us tonight to be those people willing. If you want to know what's on the heart of God, souls, souls. I wish I had the flag of Israel to put up there too. If I had it up there, I would. Israel. What's on the heart of God? Nations. They're made up of people. Nations are people. And he loves them all. He loves them all. You want to know what's on his heart? That's the only thing on his heart souls. Oh, the only reason the clock is ticking is if he takes, if he just one more second, he knows if the clock can just tick a little bit more, I can get that one. Peter said that. He said it's the only reason that time is still going is because he knows I can just still, he's not willing any would perish. And if he just waits a little longer, I can get that one. I just want us to pray tonight, taking the hand of God as Abraham and Moses did, taking that, would you just grab my arm? taking the hand of a nation because if we don't pray can you please tell me who will I want you to stretch your hands toward this nation right here as an intercessor Pastor Kent would you come and pray over this nation please church pray Amen. the word of the Lord that we've heard tonight demands a response to every one of us I was standing there and I heard the Lord say, don't make me weep over something I take from you because you can't weep over something that the world has taken from me. And there is such, we talk about the spirit of deception that's on America, but it's on the church. 
And the Bible said that when the prodigal son came to himself, yes. then he came to his father. Right. And we are never going to come back to God until we ask God to open our eyes. Hallelujah. And the only thing that ever changes God's mind is intercession. And it's the only thing the church does not do anymore. It's the least attended service. And so tonight, this message cannot be responded to fully by an altar call. This message has to be responded to by a life change. <laughs> yeah, bo -bo -bo Sunday. Hallelujah. I ask God tonight to loose the spirit of intercession upon you. May there be a groan come up out of your spirit. May you not be able to sit in front of your television because God opens your ears to hear the cry of the lost. May you no longer be drunk with prosperity, but you are filled with the wine of the Spirit. May there be a sound come out of your soul, saith the Lord, that rends the heart of heaven. And God in his own sovereignty begins to loose upon the church the ability to become the man who stands in the gap. Hallelujah, Lord. May we get an understanding that revival is not the blessing of the material world or the numbers, but it is the visitation and the habitation even of the glory of God that would settle down in this house. I come against every demon spirit that has caused us to have a prodigal spirit that says, God, I want to be in control. May there be a rendering of our hearts tonight by the Spirit of the Lord. May God wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you cannot sleep. May there be a groan come out of you that when you get up the next morning your stomach is sore. May there be a sound that comes out of you that renders hell with fear but renders heaven with a shout of exclamation because the heart of God has been touched. May God tonight, hallelujah, raise up a clarion call out of heaven over this tent meeting that the army of God is sent forth back into the spirit realm to cause the powers of darkness to be defeated in the name of the Lord. God, change us forever. Hallelujah. So I was listening, and I know this by the Spirit. There's so many people have their hopes pent on this next election. But I heard God say, you didn't have revival the first time Donald Trump was president. And you won't have revival the second time Donald Trump, if he's president. It has nothing to do with the man. It has to do with intercession. Hallelujah. Karabobobobo satarabobobo someday. We liked it because gas prices were lower and there was peace and our philosophies were manifested in the political realm. But God is saying to us, hallelujah, that prayer, 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 prayer is the answer. And if we want the prodigals of the world to come back, then there has to be the intercession that our hearts are rended because of the prodigals that sit in our own houses. If we are not moved while our children abort our grandbabies, well, we will not be moved while hell aborts the womb of the church in this hour. How can we sit silent while we watch the world go to hell on grease skids, but our own worlds are intact? May God so disrupt our own worlds. May God so disrupt us. Hallelujah. That from every night, from this night on, that God begins to awaken us. That God 
God begins to drive men back into the sanctuaries uh, that no longer is the church filled because of scheduled services. Uh, may there be such a burden of prayer that at 2 o'clock in the afternoon there are a hundred people that have come to the house of God that are saying I will stand in the gap. Uh, may there be a 10 at night. Uh, there will be parking lot full of men and women uh, that are there. Uh, if you can stay up to midnight to watch your favorite show uh, can you not stay up to midnight saith God uh, to stand in the gap uh, and declare uh, that I will join hands with God uh, and link myself in the spirit with the Lord uh, this night saith God you've heard a word of mercy uh, and that mercy is calling you back to the cross uh, back to the cross uh, and if you will lift me up saith the Lord uh, I will draw men unto me Hallelujah. So the only reason God would give us this message is because he knows that there is a people that still hear his voice. And tonight, our response to the Lord is not maybe, not perhaps. But yes, and amen. Hallelujah. Yes, and amen. Hallelujah. Not a sermon, but we heard a message from the Lord. Amen. Karen, you never disappoint me. Amen. Thank God for the anointing of the Lord. Um, we're just believing that God's going to continue on tomorrow evening. That the Spirit of God that is in this house will continue to flow out of Pastor Tony as he releases the word of the Lord. And um, there's a difference, and I want you to leave. Not under condemnation, but I want you to leave under conviction. Yes. Condemnation drives you from God. Conviction pulls you closer. So is there anything you need? My wife says we need to have prayer partners. And we need to have a praise team sing. So while our praise team is singing, I want my prayer partners to come. You know who you are. And if you need somebody that will join with you over something that you need God to do, quickly come grab one of these prayer partners as we just spend a little bit of time in the atmosphere of worship and we're going to believe that hallelujah as they pray with you that God is going to release an answer in the heavenlies so very quickly if you need somebody to pray with you today take advantage of this prayer prayer line of our prayer partners God will begin to release the word of the Lord in prayer. You are here.
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. about you but I'm changed I'm changed the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and I'm telling you what there is freedom and liberty in the word that was released tonight we honor Pastor Karen we love this woman of God God has made her a sign and a wonder in this generation but he's not stopping there. He's making every one of us in this room a sign and a wonder to change this generation for him through intercession. Do you believe that? Father, we're grateful for the word. Now, Lord, I bind every foul of the air that would come to steal the word out of the hearts, God, of your people. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, that it would penetrate deep down in our hearts. God, so deeply, oh God, Lord, that it would change every fiber of our being. Lord, you have shown your light in our hearts, and God, we will never be the same. Lord, we will never be the same. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I pray for mercy and grace as your peace people disperse to their homes, to their dwelling places tonight. Father, we ask you that the peace of God that passes understanding 
Lord, would rest upon each of your people. God, you see those that have traveled long distances. And Lord, I ask you to give them rest and perfect serenity tonight and a good night's rest in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. We love you. Now we got uh, Brother Tony Suarez tomorrow night. I'm telling you what, this man is on fire. Cannot wait to hear the message that God has for us tomorrow night. Are you glad you came? I'm so glad. I'm so glad. All right. Well, y'all go see Cooper over there at the table. He can't wait to see you. He's waiting on you. I love you. We start tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Come early and get a good seat. I love you. God bless you.